Hi everyone, this is the 19th episode of the RGSL Chat Chamber and this time, as it is almost a new year, uh, we have a new, <laughs> so to say, new wind has brought a, a replacement for Christopher's this time, Marcus, also from the third year of Law and Diplomacy. And this time we welcome Martin Schmitz, who has been a prorector at RGSL for some period of time. And currently he is more for more than six years uh, a judge at the European Court uh, of Human Rights. Uh, hi Martin, how Hello. are you today? Hello, thank you, nice to meet you. <laughs> Great, um, maybe you want to start with a question? Yeah, I, I will stick to the chase and ask the question regarding you becoming a judge, this transition in the career from the RGSL to becoming European Court of Human Rights judge. So could you please elaborate how can one become the judge in the European Court of Human Rights apart from the classical procedure which is carried by the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly? My question would be, how does the potential candidate even get the nomination by the state uh, to be one of the potential candidates to, sp to fill the spot? Well, that's a pretty complicated procedure which has been developed over the years because uh, I think that everyone is interested that those people who end up in the position of a judge are the uh, are the ones which uh, deserve this position and um, therefore the the requirements are, are are high and the vetting procedure as well is is uh, I, I would say pretty tough uh, which is uh, to there are two levels so so first you have to go through the procedure on domestic level in, in, well, there is some flexibility, I think, how all the countries organize this. In, in Latvia, for example, that was a public call of applications. And then uh, there was a committee composed of members uh, from various public institutions, I guess also from, from NGO sector. Uh, which selected or interviewed each candidate and I think they're, they're, they were shortlisted uh, and then the, as a result of the domestic procedure uh, three candidates are selected and the list is sent further to the Council of Europe institutions and then there is an informal a committee of experts which provides its uh, opinion uh, which is not binding, but you know it's composed usually of the former judges or high-level persons. So that's one thing. And, and then there is a special committee within the uh, parliamentary assembly whose task is to interview candidates. So all, all of us uh, had to, to go through the, through the interviews uh, with, with tough questions, checking your knowledge of the convention as well as was other other quest, uh, other types of competences i guess they are looking for so and uh, then they propose uh, uh, or they arrange the candidates in the list with number 1 which kind of a, uh, they give their recommendation to be elected and then there is a formal vote in the parliamentary assembly so everyone has to go uh, through it and uh, at least uh, in 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 my case there were no uh, no any uh, problems in, in the procedure, but we uh, actually encounter uh, on a number of occasions situations when the country lists which come from the, from the country which reach the uh, Council of Europe, they are rejected. Nobody is elected. And for example, at the moment we have a Ukrainian judge whose term expired, I guess, three years ago, but the government has not been able to submit a list uh, which would comply with the with the requirements, and it has it, these lists keep to be rejected all the time. Could you elaborate on what kind of requirements are the ones which Ukraine apparently cannot satisfy? Well, they are not. Uh, I mean, uh, there are some requirements which are spelled out, and some requirements, perhaps involving competences and so on, which are not spelled out in the convention itself, but. I think that uh, one of the major major problems uh, links with the uh, competence and independence of the candidates you know, because uh, what the Council of Europe wants uh, it, it w and what is important to remember the judge does not represent the country. There are 47 judges, each of them is elected 
in respect of one country, but they act as independent experts. They do not act as representatives of the country. So, and that's that's first and and the most important actually rule. And um, I, I guess uh, you know, on a number of occasions there are there are problems linked to that. But domestically, uh, when there was uh, a voting, you were elected with quite extensive uh, um, amount of votes comparing to other candidates. What would be your guess? Why was it that so? Were you seen as more suitable candidate, or how 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 was the situation back then? Well, there are various factors, and and in in my particular case, which was uh, interesting, and which is not that usual, all three candidates who we were on the list, actually we had academic background, I guess already at at, at that time, and uh, so. I had the combination which probably was was the most beneficial because uh, essentially I was uh, teaching the convention European Convention for Human Rights for many years uh, now now I'm I'm still working with it but from a completely different perspective you know but the, the this theoretical framework I I think also in in my judicial position is is an asset which is very valuable asset and so, but on the other hand, now I see that being just an academician and, and talking about the convention, uh, you miss something which comes with practice, with practical application. And, and these two elements are really good, which, which gives you a, a much fuller picture of actually how it is to apply one of the leading uh, international human rights treaties in the world. Just to discuss this a bit further, uh, you mentioned that you had this academic background, but if we go back to the reports, the Daigo Zevska, Artur Skuc, they both have academic records. Um, they, they are professors at the University of Latvia. Currently, they are also judges in the Constitutional Court. So maybe there were like some personal characteristics that made you the best candidate to win the election? Uh, listen, this is a uh, question you have to ask to the members of the committee which interviewed mm-hmm. us. So, and uh, I think that uh, for several reasons I will not go into details of that. Uh, but, um, but, but that's exactly the point. Um, and there is one interesting uh, element which I would like to tell you. We had the presentation in the court. There was one, one Danish professor who was um, carrying out research on the background of judges. And when the court was established back in, in, in the very beginning of 50s, of the last century, previous century, um, the, the, compos- the background of the judges was equally composed of judicial background, academic background, and political background, meaning former ambassadors and, and people who have been involved in politics. And perhaps uh, that's, that's evidence that when a new institution, even like the European Court of Human Rights is established, it's important to, to, to gain its authority, which you, you, you have to not only uh, think in terms of, uh, uh, of law, but also of judicial policy. And this mixture of backgrounds, I guess, is, resembles the fact that it is important for even fully judicial institution uh, to have a certain element of judicial policy, and in particular at its beginning. Now, uh, today, the shift is absolutely and predominantly switched uh, to the judicial backgrounds of judges. Like pure academics as myself who enter the European Court of Human Rights, it's, it's really rather an exception as a rule. Of course, there are uh, many judges who also teach but they are judges and teach, you know, but, but pure academics, it's less. As well as there are very, very few pure uh, judges now with political background. So once the, the court is established, you know, then the law uh, takes over and, 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 and rules. That's interesting. I, I wanted to know, um, this is, I think, maybe a very common question for you, but uh, when it comes to reading cases and how do you um, become objective? I know that's very hard for a person to be objective in a sense because human beings are emotional and they're com- like they look at life from subjective perspective. But when there is a case, maybe you have an example and you read it 
and you have this emotional human being feeling, how you differentiate yourself from these kind of emotions? I mean, uh, if you are not, if you are not able to look upon the case from a perspective of law, then it's not professional. You know, it's it's part of judicial profession. You have to be able to uh, to put aside your own feelings, sympathies, emotions, and to look at the case from a perspective of law. It doesn't mean that judges are not humans and that you don't take into account you know the context of the case and it can play less or, or bigger role in, in deciding the case but of course what is primary is the law if the complaint you see where there is such an obvious injustice but if such a complaint doesn't comply with admissibility rules it's inadmissible that's it end of the story so uh, yeah, and then and, and, you know that the concept of, of impartiality it, it has two two sides. It's uh, it's objective impartiality and subjective impartiality, which means that uh, objective impartiality is how uh, my independence as a judge looks for an outsider, for lay person, uh, which is even a standard applied, but by the court. And subjective uh, element is how I myself feel about the case. So. Uh, if I would have feeling that no, I'm, my my feelings do not allow me to to be objective in the case, then I would recuse. Uh, and and the same, I have to think very carefully about the objective element as well. Uh, for example, I, I have withdrawn from a from a quite uh, several cases because uh, my wife is a judge at the Supreme Court in Latvia. So she has sat in, in, in a number of cases, uh, which then reached the European Court of Human Rights. And if I would sit in those cases, for, a, for an outsider, there would be immediately a question, can really I be impartial if my wife has decided on the case, you yes, know? And although if I could, I nevertheless uh, withdraw because I would not comply with the standard of objective impartiality. Mm, yeah, definitely. I think it comes back to the factor that also the tri tribunal has to look I impartial, even if you would be objective there. Um, I think that's also codified in the ECTHR practice. Um, coming back to the cases, I want to ask you, what are the main characteristics of Latvian cases, apart from the classical prisoner cases, that uh, usually arrive to the European Court of Human Rights? Well, in, pr in principle, Latvia generates rather interesting and, and legally uh, complicated uh, questions, which for me, I take it as that the standard of the convention is quite well known in general in Latvia, and so that those cases which, we, which reach the European Court of Human Rights, they have something, you know, an interesting legal twist, uh, interesting question in, in, in there. But recently what we are dealing, there are a number of Article 8 cases, uh, one, several cases have concerned entrapment or alleged entrapment that the people say that the police had made them to commit a crime, for example. Searches also was in the framework of Article 8, which is uh, private and family life. Uh, we have had a couple of, of freedom of, of expression cases which are also interesting and, and including the balancing of, of uh, freedom of expression of the journalists uh, with the protection of privacy when, when pictures are taken of, of, of persons leaving the, uh, leaving the hospital with a newborn baby, for example. Uh, we have Article 5 cases, which is um, uh, freedom, uh, right to freedom and, and, and security of a person uh, in terms of whether the deprivation of liberty has been in accordance uh, with law in, in a very specific situation, for example, when a person uh, whose car has been stopped has made to sit in a car for a couple of hours. Does this amount to uh, deprivation of liberty or not? Uh, Article 3 cases with, with some conditions of, uh, of um, imprisonment, although I must say that in, in principle the, the internal remedies function pretty well in this situation. So, and, and this is important principle that for all people who want to bring their cases to European Court of Human Rights, they have to exhaust remedies domestically. 
and so which means if someone thinks that his uh, prison conditions are bad, you know, amount to ill treatment contrary to Article 3 of the Convention, then first they have to go to administrative courts in Latvia with this claim. If they don't, we, we simply say, sorry, non-exhaustion, when the case is not admissible. Uh, but actually there are also, as in all countries, uh, also in Latvia, issues with the length of proceedings from time to time, uh, cases which are on borderline, uh, like Article 6 fair trial, which includes the guarantee that the, the trial has to take uh, in due time. I must say that the, the European Court of Human Rights, although it cannot be judged according to the European Convention of Human Rights, has itself enormous problems with the length of proceedings itself, because at the moment there are uh, 70,000 cases pending before the European Court of Human Rights, before uh, uh, 47 judges. Although we, we can process more than, I think that it's more than 2,000, yeah, it's, it's uh, almost two and a five uh, uh, thousand judgments, only judgments which are adopted per year, we still cannot manage to deal with, with all the cases which are even pending. It would take several years, in theory, just to deal with the cases which are currently pending, if no new cases would arrive, but they do arrive. And uh, the, the court is, is trying to look and discovering some new ways uh, how it may uh, process cases faster. Uh, and uh, recently there have been some, some new uh, methods introduced again, but of course there are also limits to that, what the court can do on its own with improving working methods and, and uh, the, the ultimate solution of, of this problem that the court, or the problem of the workload that the court itself um, is facing is lies on the domestic law level, simply in the ideal application of the convention standard domestically. In, in other interviews you have elaborated on this seven section system that the court has to, to adjudicate the cases and you have also men mentioned that there is this priority aspect to several cases. So could you elaborate on which cases do get the priority in the system? Uh, well, yeah, there are altogether five. All the judges are divided into five sections. Uh, so Latvia uh, falls into section five. Uh, there are uh, ten judges in, in the section. Uh, I'm vice president of that section. Uh, we have um, actually in the chain, well, and this is in the section, it is the place where judges uh, in the number of seven consider the cases. Now these are complicated legal cases. Only those reach the section level where, where, uh, where seven judges decide each case. Uh, those cases which are uh, where, where the, the legal questions are not kind of a borderline violation, no violation, and there is established uh, practice in, in, in the case law of the court. All those cases are decided on the level of a committee by three judges, although the decision has to be taken uh, unanimously. If one judge disagrees, then the case goes uh, to the chamber for, for seven judges. Uh, and then the, the most complicated cases uh, may directly go to the grand chamber, which is composed of 17 judges, uh, or uh, also a chamber of seven judges may decide to relinquish a case uh, and, and not to deal with it, and it goes to the chamber. But uh, yeah, uh, the priority system and, and all these um, new cases which, uh, which arrive, they are provisionally uh, put into one of, of, of seven uh, categories and it will determine how fast this case will move through the system. And if it is case where there can be uh, enormous impact on, on the applicant, on the applicant's human rights, uh, then this, uh, this would go into the top categories. For example, extradition cases is a traditional example. Yeah? If, if, he, if the person, for example, is going to be extradited to the United States where he might face a death penalty and such a person uh, comes to the court and says please first of all stop uh, stop uh, stop the proceedings there is such a possibility to introduce uh, so-called interim measures under rule 39 and then to stay this but so in, in general such a case would fall into category one because if it is not decided speedily 
uh, then it will be already too late and and um, then irreparable, irreparable harm would have been done to the person he might be convicted in the United States and face this penalty which under the European Convention of Human Rights uh, this penalty is prohibited and there is a prohibition therefore on all the Council of Europe member states uh, to extradite, to send persons to the countries where there is a real risk that they might face this penalty. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one example. And then there are cases which might concern some whatever, not that important dispute between a person and another person and he thinks that there has been some procedural irregularity or that the time it has been too long for, for the courts on domestic level to decide the case. This case would go somewhere into the category seven, you know, and, and would wait for, for a long time to be to be decided because the court somehow has to so has to manage this huge amount of cases which come in like a river all the time and uh, to, 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 be, to deal mean, meaningfully with those cases, therefore this category uh, of, of, of seven categories have been established which will determine how fast the case will be dealt with. I, uh, I started to wonder about um, the domestic situation that we have currently here. Uh, and it's also, you know, all over all over the world during like COVID pandemic, it, like everything has totally shifted the way how people also see each other. That we have been divided into two fronts: the ones who are in favor and who are against vaccines, and everything. And this is like an introduction towards my question uh, of freedom of expression. And I I have read one uh, British novelist who said. What is freedom of expression? It's uh, basically why f freedom of, of end ceases to exist. So I wanted to ask you, where is the borderline, in your personal opinion, between freedom of expression and freedom of offense, where it collides each other? Well, everything is relative. That's my answer. <laughs> yeah. And it, it simply depends on the paradigm how at this point in time we understand what is the relevant freedom and uh, I, I, uh, I, I completely agree with you with your introduction I think that pandemic changes paradigms and this is what is happening and for human rights uh, it's a dangerous process and uh, yeah and also what is happening in the society it is uh, it is really, really bad if the point of a dispute and discussion is not what is the impact on relevant rights and freedoms, but whether you are vaxxer or anti-vaxxer. That's besides the point. And unfortunately, this is the world in which we are living. And I think that somehow uh, most of people do not want or, or are unable to to see this. Yeah, definitely. And uh, do you see any linkage uh, between um, the situation, what's going on in Hungary or Poland to COVID that people, so to say, and the government, they, they feel more in power or that they, they see the, this uh, instability of the uh, situation currently in the world that they take more um, risky uh, and bold decisions uh, towards uh, human rights violations, or they would uh, come anyways, in your opinion? I mean, the, 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 the situation of pandemic, uh, well, creates the conditions which can be used and are used uh, in various ways by the governments and, and by, the, by the, those people dissatisfied uh, as well. So, um, of course, there, there are examples when, the, uh, when for example, in, in Poland, uh, controversial amendments in the law were adopted at the time when there were uh, restrictions concerning uh, freedom of assembly, so which uh, limited possibility of, of opponents to use uh, the, the, the freedoms which are detrimental for democracy, you know, to go to the streets and protest, for example. That's, that's one simple example. Uh, the, on the other hand, you know, uh, the same freedom of, of, um, of assembly 
uh, is sometimes misused uh, when when people who are dissatisfied with the governmental policies in, in relation to COVID, for example, get violent, you know, and 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 starts uh, start to do uh, things which uh, even human rights do not protect, because uh, European Convention of Human Rights, for example, does not protect violent uh, assemblies. Uh, so. Um, of course, uh, that's, uh, that's a new reality in which we are living, uh, uh, which we are uh, creating worldwide and uh, people, governments are adapting to it. And, but what's important to remember, it's important, uh, uh, irrelevant how at the, is the paradigm of understanding of human rights changing or not, the principle of proportionality does not cease to exist. It still exists. And in whatever, in, in context of pandemic, whatever restrictions of human rights are imposed, they have to comply with the principle of proportionality. And uh, we are receiving in the European Court of Human Rights uh, hundreds and, and, and thousands of, of applications of various sorts. And uh, the peculiarity of human rights themselves is that they penetrate all fields all spheres of life you know and and therefore uh the way how in the pan situation of pandemic human rights can be affected that they, they can manifest themselves in a multiplicity of ways so uh and 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 and, and therefore yeah uh, the european court of human rights are dealing and will have to deal in the future with very many aspects concerning uh, concerning uh, uh, pandemic, uh, I uh, we are communicating at the moment one one very interesting uh, complaint uh, concerning freedom of expression uh, in the terms of uh, pandemic uh, when the person was deprived of liberty. Uh, and so we'll see. I wanted to ask regarding. As you mentioned, we, we live in these COVID times when the human rights violations can happen quite regularly. My question would be, how can, in these times, we can balance the right of assembly for people to express their dissent of the possible government measures, but at the same time uh, follow the epidemiological uh, laws within the country? What What is the balance here? I mean, uh, another peculiarity, uh, it's impossible to speak in abstracts, you know. And, and that's what you learn when you become a judge. Uh, so answer to the question might depend, and it depends actually on the circumstances of the situation. But I remember when at, at, at the beginning uh, in, in, in spring uh, 2020, when, when the whole pandemic uh, came about, uh, I was speaking in, in one conference and I was looking for for uh, examples of uh, what are the reactions in terms of human rights restrictions to, to, to the emerging situation which was emerging at that time. And for example, at that, at that time an, an example came from one of the uh, German states when they uh, restricted freedom of assembly uh, at the time when, when the pandemic was on, at its peak uh, in, in spring 2020. They restricted, but they did not ab abolish it totally. So they said that they regulated the total number of persons who could participate in, in assembly, in demonstration, and so on, including that they have to obey with the rule of, of cer keeping certain distance, whatever it was, 1.5 or 2 meters, something like that. So, but I mean, that's simply an example, you know, but that's an example where, where authorities indeed applied uh, strict proportionality uh, considerations in assessing the situation and the freedom. And instead of simply cutting uh, the freedom in its essence, they uh, thought what is possible in this situation, you know, and, and, and offered such a solution, for example. So that's, that's an answer. But as a side of uh, your work, what how do you fulfill yourself um what are your hobbies what do you like to do to get your head clear after a hard day at work well i mean uh my first hobby is my family meaning i have three children of various ages so i'm i'm, I'm really busy person 
Yeah. And um, but uh, just talking about the things which which I really like uh, first probably is to say I like traveling, and the location of Strasbourg uh, gives for this excellent opportunity. It's a one hour drive to Switzerland. Uh, let's say in 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 two and a half hours you are you reach uh, Swiss Alps, for example. That's uh, great. Uh, 15 minutes drive, you are in Germany. Uh, and, and then, like, driving a bit further, you can, you can explore a lot of, of places in Germany. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's actually uh, more difficult to reach uh, another bigger city in France from Strasbourg than, than going somewhere <laughs> yeah. in Germany. But what I'm saying is that, indeed, the, the, the location is, is really good for, 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 for travels. And then, when we have a possibility, our family does it a lot. Uh, one of my hobbies is, and now a bit less, but it, it is photography, uh, which I can combine with traveling, which is excellent. Uh, I really like it. Um, interestingly, I have never done it before, but uh, since we are in uh, Strasbourg, we Latvians who are there have established a choir. We have our own wow. choir. We sing. And now we have also resumed uh, our choir uh, repetitions, actually. So um, th that would suffice. That would suffice <laughs> with, with the hobbies. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I mean, there are people who say that uh, being a lawyer is like a hobby for them. So I, I wanted to understand whether you are also the kind of person that who would say that your hobby is also to be a judge, or you differentiate your uh, work life with your family and hobbies. Would you say that, you know, no, everything in my life is about being a judge right now? Yeah, or, yeah, or I see. Uh, well, uh, I like law. Uh, I like uh, being a lawyer, a judge, and, and uh, applying law. I like it a lot. and. Uh, and uh, but unfortunately, I have to do it a lot also while being at home in the evening. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, because uh, not every evening, of course, but it happens. Uh, and the judge's work is that you know it's like uh, waves in the in the ocean. Sometimes they are big, sometimes small, and and sometimes there is a calm. Uh, so which means that sometimes you have to to work a lot. But uh, law is just one, uh, and, and I would even say not most important part of human's life. Life is much bigger and more interesting than that. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, yeah. Well, my life may be much more interesting than that. I actually would like to go back to your work <laughs> and discuss <laughs> cases. And while we were on the subject of uh, COVID, uh, I wanted to discuss the particular judgment. Uh, this year, the court's grand chamber uh, um, yeah, issued the first judgment on compulsory childhood vaccination. In the given case, if I remember correctly, the, the court evaluated the Czech Republic's legislative act requiring parents to, to vaccinate their children uh, for non-communicable diseases for them to be able to, admitted, to be admitted to school. And uh, in given case, they found no violation of Article 8, the right to respect for the private life. And um, in the that was the first case, if, I, if I'm correct here, on the vaccination that ECTHR has evaluated. And my question would be, well, well, the events in the case were in the pre-COVID times. Uh, could this case act as the reference point for the ongoing debate on the et ethics of the COVID-19 compulsory vaccination? Well, yeah, indeed, this is the first case where the court had to deal with the question of mandatory vaccination. And, uh, but of course, what is important, important is to keep in mind that it, it related to the um, mandatory vaccination of children uh, and uh, the disagreement by the parents. And in, in what was uh, in that case, so the father was uh, administratively punished for that he refused. Uh, that his children get vaccinated. Uh, some children were not allowed to attend a kindergarten, so prohibited from, from attending it. But those children who were at the school age, they, they didn't have any consequences, they could attend the school, you know. And this situation 
uh, having these consequences of uh, a fine on a father and uh, children not being able to attend kindergarten uh, and, and later would be able to attend the school, the, the court uh, considered that since it is necessary to uh, to develop this herd immunity uh, for the children in order to protect in particular those who for medical reasons cannot get vaccinated so it is it is justified and it is proportionate but these are the circumstances of, of that check case what is clear of course that the the, the, the very principles uh, about uh, the, the the herd uh, immunity and and uh, some some solidarity uh, which, which is inherent in that judgment uh, are also relevant for other types of vaccinations, including the mandatory vaccination in the, in the situation of COVID. However, we have to keep in mind that factually, of course, uh, the situations are not comparable. Uh, but uh, the court will, will have to deal with the question of, of, the, of the mandatory vaccination in terms of COVID, and it will be exactly our section. We have France in our section. We have cases a uh, case which has been communicated at the moment from uh, persons who are firefighters uh, complain against their mandatory vaccination because France uh, determined that there are three categories of uh, people like police officers, uh, medical personnel and firefighters who have to be vaccinated mandatorily and if not then they, they are suspended uh, from, from, from their work actually. And so the firefighters submitted a complaint. Initially, they tried to obtain the 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 the, the, the court applies Rule 39, saying that please stop implement, implementing this law until we decide the case. But our section said that no, uh, this request uh, exceeds uh, the, the 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 scope of Rule 39. In in other words, Rule 39 is not meant for such type of situations. Uh, and did not apply. But the, the question on the merits, it will it is pending before the court. It will be decided sooner or later. Indeed, as it is your section, I want to discuss also some criticism of the case. For example, the British Institute of Human Rights mentioned that while they agree that the, the for the three, uh, the application of the three-step test, while well, the given measure was lawful, as it was based on the Czech Legislative Act, indeed it was legitimate, there was, I think, they invoke the exceptions of uh, pr protection of public safety, public morals and health, but they didn't really agree to the proportionality aspect, which, uh, as they saw that there were less restrictive uh, uh, alternatives to the given measure of the compulsory vaccination, uh, for example, introducing uh, protective equipment, increased testing. So, as, as this case is highly relevant in these circumstances, would you think that this critics has some valid points? Well, I cannot share with you or argue uh, with the arguments, uh, in particular if uh, there might be, they might be relevant in, in the case which is pending before the court, but I can explain how uh, methodologically the court acts in a situation uh, when, uh, when it has to uh, provide for proportionality considerations. It has to understand how broad so-called margin of appreciations for the states exist in the relevant situation. And what the court does, it looks at the state practice. It looks at the practice in other states. And if there is a, let's say, very strong indications of particular behavior in, in, in the Council of Europe member states overall, then the court would say the margin of appreciation for that one particular country is rather narrow, it is limited, you know, because we, we can, we can uh, discern the human rights standard from the overall practice of, of Europe. Then, we, then the court, when it establishes or clarifies the, the human rights standard, um, it, it has a strong basis when it looks what is the overall situation in, in other member states. Yeah. Uh, if, if there is no such a, such a, uh, such a uniform standard, uh, then the, the so-called margin of appreciation for, for that particular state is broader, the, 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 how, how the, this state may maneuver 
in, in deciding uh, and applying proportionality. And for the court, that means if the margin of appreciation is broad for the state, then uh, the court cannot apply very strict proportionality considerations going to such details as you mentioned. Uh, and, and so, uh, in, in, of course, in, in the Czech case, the, the, the European Court of Human Rights also looked at the state practice and it came to the conclusion what the margin of appreciation is uh, does not allow for, for particularly strict, you know, um, considerations of proportionality. Indeed, I, I just thought that the decision was, uh, judgment was really smartly written in the, in the way how they just didn't evaluate the margin of appreciation, they just said that it did not exceed because there was no state practice as you mentioned. Uh, currently, uh, I, as we are talking about cases, uh, I, uh, I remembered uh, the very recent case concerning uh, what we understand as family under the constitution in Latvia as uh, currently it's very disputable case uh, when the judgment of administrative regional court was uh, cancelled. Um, and I wanted to go maybe a little bit more into depth of this. Can, uh, when we look at the uh, domestic uh, law system, and I previously also asked uh, you about the personal subjective perspective uh, of law, if you had to say concerning this specific case, what, what would be the grounds of um, subjectiveness uh, in this case, especially if this regional court uh, judgment has been cancelled and now everything is being reviewed within, within the constitutional level, and uh, there have been many different kind of arguments, also the, 100, uh, the, the Article 110, and um, about also basic human rights uh, as people with different uh, sexual orientation. Well. The, the, of course, the question of um, the right of uh, some homosexual persons uh, either to register their relationships or to marry is, uh, is topical not only for Latvia, but you can imagine for, for many uh, Council of Europe member states and the court from time to time has to deal with it. And as the things stand now, at the moment, uh, the, the, as the European Court of Human Rights has interpreted this um, convention in this regard, uh, then we can say that there is no right under Article 12 uh, to marry, which the uh, homosexual persons uh, can invoke. Uh, there are, but there are certain situations under Article 8 of private and family life where uh, the court has said that um, the state has to provide a possibility to uh, register relationships. And actually, uh, in this regard, recently, uh, another section of, of the court, uh, so seven judges, adopted a decision uh, against Russia where in principle they said that uh, Russia has to provide for a possibility to homosexual persons to register their relationships under Article 10, uh, Article 8, sorry, uh, of the convention. But uh, this judgment was, so the Russian government requested its relinquishment to the Grand Chamber, so there is a possibility during three months, uh, the parties may require that judgment delivered by seven judges is reviewed in the Grand Chamber by 17 judges. Uh, but only if it concerns uh, really uh, important questions of the interpretation of the convention. And this happened in this case. Russian government asked and, uh, and so the, the committee of judges uh, agreed. And so this judgment of the section has not entered into force. Now this case is pending before the Grand Chamber. And in fact, this is the first case uh, where the court has in principle uh, unconditionally uh, laid down uh, the right to register relationships for, for homosexual persons. Uh, but as I said, uh, it has not entered into force and this question is pending uh, before the Grand Chamber now. Yeah, good to know. When you mentioned Russia, the Navalny case came to my mind over the February this year. And we also before talked about pre prioritizing cases on the, and you, you mentioned that the cases which 
which introduced inter interim measures are given the priority. And regarding extradition, there was also, I think, case of Belgium, when it extradited the prisoner to the United States, which where they did not comply with the interim measure. And similarly, in the Navalny case, we see that also Russian government does, did not comply with the measure that he should be released. And these two cases um, imply this question, what can the court do to ensure the compliance with the judgments and the interim measures? Well, yeah, uh, as to the interim measures, the, the court has uh, come to the conclusion that if it finds that the government does not comply with interim measure, this constitutes um, a violation of Article 34 of the European Convention of Human Rights, right, to submit a complaint to the court. Uh, but, and, and of course, uh, the, but the, the valid question is what the court can do. Uh, the court can do nothing and it is not authorized to do anything if the member states do not uh, comply with the court's judgments. The European Convention of Human Rights explicitly entitles the Committee of Ministers, the political body of the Council of Europe, to uh, supervise uh, implementation and execution of the court's judgments. So it is the mandate uh, the competence of the uh, committee of ministers to deal with these questions how they are doing it well that's that's for you to judge uh, but um, a few years ago there was a f first case when the committee of ministers used a tool which is available uh, to it which is again the european convention of human rights allows Committee of Ministers to come before the European Court of Human Rights expressly with a question whether the member state has or has not complied with the ruling of, of, of the European Court of Human Rights. And it, this case, uh, first case was Mamadov versus Azerbaijan. And the European Court of Human Rights found indeed that uh, Azerbaijan did not comply. And it was the situation uh, also where they uh, the applicant uh, had to be released following uh, the violation of Article 5 and, and 6 of, of the European Convention of, of Human Rights. And uh, the, the Committee of Ministers requested it. Uh, the, the government did not comply and the Committee of Ministers came before the court and the court found a violation. So th there, is a, there is a procedure, legal procedure again, which the Committee of Ministers can, can use. Usually it is a matter of, of political decision making in the, in the Committee of Ministers. Uh, but so first of all, they, they use the possibility and obtained a legally binding judgment from the court, acknowledging non-compliance with, with the court's ruling. And that's it. But uh, what, what uh, tools are at disposal of the Committee of Ministers? How they may discipline uh, a member state which does not want to comply? Well, it, it's up to them. The, the, the voting rights can be suspended as it happened, for example, with Russia a few years ago, but not for this reason, but uh, for the uh, for the uh, annexation of the Ukrainian territory. Uh, there can be expulsion as the ultimate measure from the Council of Europe, but this, this is a matter of, of high politics already. When you mention the expulsion option, um, I, I'm just thinking, um, c can it actually be applied in practice, whether it is whether it can actually be a good measure to apply, because essentially it restricts the access of the country's citizens to the court. Right? Yeah. I, I think that there, there are very good arguments, and we have heard uh, these arguments in particular in relation to Russia, that, uh, that if, if, uh, yeah, if Russia, for example, would not have been a member of the Council of Europe, then the, the, all the citizens would be uh, denied possibility to submit compliance to the European Convention of Human Rights. And in general, I must say, I, I think that it's really very fortunate and important for for all countries are actually of the Council of Europe but for some uh, for some even more so that there is this external view on what's happening in the country from a perspective of uh, international human rights standards and it, 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 it empowers citizens in, in many respects uh, towards their own governments uh, domestically when uh, when the governments uh, are not democratic enough, you know. 
but uh, there are also um, there are also negative aspects to that. You you might say that uh, if you uh, provide this this possibility of of giving a possibility to complain to the European Court of Human Rights and to get some justice there and also for for the government to, to kind of negotiate you know on, on on the implementation of some judgments and so on actually this way contributes to conservation of the status quo and does not bring uh, bigger changes which may come only from within definitely um as we're coming close to an end of this uh, conversation um we have this uh, tradition to ask maybe you uh, have a question towards us uh, if not uh, then maybe some wishes to the listeners or or um, i don't know new lawyers new judges uh, to come um, for the next generations yeah thanks uh, thanks for 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 giving this possibility you know that uh, rgsl has a special place in my heart because it's it has been a home my professional home for a very long time so i wonder uh, how do you find studying at RGSL? What's your impression <laughs> and uh, overall assessment? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, honestly, uh, I think this one indicator of my experience is that I came back for my master's. Definitely, I do not regret that I decided to study here. Uh, one of the largest, uh, greatest benefits is uh, development of English language. That you, actually for me, it's way much easier to talk and think uh, and write uh, papers in English now. And the background, if, if I have to look from students' perspective as a future uh, specialist, I know that my main goal was to not stay in Latvia, that I wanted to go abroad and uh, live and work uh, in a, I don't know, in any country uh, which uh, can give you a, a workplace uh, when you know uh, English language and you have the necessary knowledge for EU and international law. I can definitely say that I have gained and uh, received the necessary background. I studied my, uh, my bachelor's in law and diplomacy and now I'm studying in law and finance. And I find, find it very use, useful for future uh, of uh, career uh, work uh, place to have this combination of skills, interdisciplinary perspective. Because now I can say that I look at law and what it does and how it functions within diplomatic field, uh, how it works in politic, a political aspect and how it is now also in finance, how businesses operate with law. And uh, I, I think, I know that for a lawyer to live and work in Latvia, Elu is the place. But if you want to go and have the startup uh, for international work, um, I know that I chose the right place. <laughs> and you? Yeah, uh, as I just saw administration, watch this. I think I will, <laughs> I will, I will be rather <laughs> diplomatic and say, it, it has been challenging but self-fulfilling and uh, yeah indeed on more serious note I enjoy studies here yeah I like it here oh I like it that I gave so elaborate answer as a woman tend to do <laughs> and then uh, and then you answered in two questions uh, no, two, in two sentences. And, uh, thank, thanks for being frank but uh, what what I would like to wish uh, I, I think that's a, that's a right place to come here to study uh, this place offers the knowledge take as much as you can because it will be useful later for what you are doing professionally as well as uh, it will be useful for developing you as a person and uh, after all um, do not uh, do not lose values uh, and uh, also in terms of human rights do not uh, forget uh, the, the the basis on which the human rights were developed uh, after the Second World World uh, internationally and the basis of uh, human dignity on which it stands. All the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming. I, I think it, this was very useful. And uh, I think that this is one of like the only, one of the at least least um, uh, of episodes where we went so in depth of cases and you 
as a person who works with them in your everyday life, you could give us this in look how a judge looks at the case and how it works within because previously we didn't have this opportunity. So thank you for that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.